need the Lord to make a way for you this morning, would you just raise your hand? If it's any situation, say, Lord, I need you to make a way for me this morning. Father, you see these hands in this room and you are a way maker. You're a way maker for difficult circumstances. You're a way maker for difficult conversations. You're a way maker, Lord, in all ways, God. We acknowledge you this morning, God. And for every person whose hands raised this morning, I ask, Lord, that you would touch them and that you would meet them right in their situation. You are a God that is not distant from us. You will show up instantaneously if we call out your name. And so, Father, because of Jesus, we have access to come boldly and confidently before your throne with the things that we need. And I ask, Lord, for every person in this room with their hands raised, Lord, that you would meet them in a very special way. Right now, this morning, this week, that there would be testimonies that would be so numerous in this house that we don't even have room to share. We just don't have enough time to share all of the things you've done. Let our eyes be open to see the things you're doing. Let our ears be open to hear the things you're saying. Let us be aware of your presence. We love you today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, good morning. It's Christmas week. Wow, wow, you sound real excited about that. It's Christmas week. Yeah, it is Christmas week. Um, I want to start this morning by saying, if you miss carols by candlelight, you miss something spectacular. Uh, and I, uh, and I encourage you though, it's not the same experience. I encourage you to go watch it online to, to, to check that out. Um, and I just want to thank, there is a team that really made that night happen. And so I just want to show our appreciation to those who worked behind the scenes to make that, to make that possible. Um, thank you. Thank you guys so much for, for that. I don't have my notes on the back here, um, up in the loft. Uh, second, um, we are going to have uh, a change in our gathering schedule starting on January 9th. Uh, starting January 9th, we are no longer going to have an early gathering. We are going to have this gathering at 1030, and we're going to have a gathering at 6 p.m. Those will be our two Sunday gatherings. Uh, I believe that we're entering into a season where God is going to bring some people into the house that we haven't seen before. And I think that that time, uh, that time frame is going to be a real special service, a uh, uh, gathering time starting at 6 p.m. So if you're asking me what does that mean for you or what I would like you to do, which not many people ask me that, but if you're asking me what I want you to do, I'd like half of you to make the evening gathering your choice service. And I would like all of you to invite two people to come to church. That's what I would like to see happen, okay? But come and be a part of that, 10.30, 6 p.m. Uh, today was our last early gathering. So the 26th and the 2nd, the next two Sundays, we will have one gathering due to the proximity to Christmas Day and New Year's. But we will start those two gatherings starting on January 9th, 10.30 and 6 p.m. So make plans uh, to attend uh, one of those. And then, of course, Saturday is Christmas Day. Saturday is Christmas Day. And uh, let me tell you, I hope that you will make plans to come and celebrate Christ with us uh, at a very special gathering on Saturday, 11 to 12 o'clock. I promise it won't go one minute over. We will get you out of here because I know you have plans. But boy, if you come to that gathering, you will not regret it. Come and be a part as we celebrate Christ on Christmas Day. It is Christmas week, so we have a lot to celebrate, don't we? Yeah, I'm real excited. Well, um, I don't know how long I'm going to be up here today. I thought it was going to be a little shorter than uh, what it was. It was shorter in first gathering. We'll see what happens today. Would you guys stand with me? We're going to read our scripture together. I think we're going to read our scripture together. Da, da, da. Oh, oh. Let's go back. <laughs> faster, faster. <laughs> Here we go. Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David. Because he belonged to the house and line of David, he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. 
an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Father, I thank you for your peace. And I thank you, Lord, for your, Lord God, for your son, Jesus, who came to bring peace. I pray today, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that the things that are of me would fall to the wayside. But Lord, that you would really grip our hearts for the things that you want us to change. Open up our eyes to see you, our ears to hear you, our spirits, let, it, let them connect with you this morning as we enter in and engage in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Well, it is, it is Christmas time. And if you're anything like my family over the years, this week represents a reception of family. Uh, some of you will probably have friends or family coming and staying at your house, or maybe you'll be getting uh, in the car or on a plane and going elsewhere to see family. It is a season of making room. It's a season of making space, creating room. I know that Sherry and I have had time. Sherry has a, a larger family uh, than I have, and uh, so and they're from the West Coast. So when they come, it's not on Christmas Day just for lunch and then they leave. It's it's the stay for a little while. And, and when they come to our, to our house, if they all come, we could have up to 18 people sleeping at our house. And uh, so I don't know how much room you have, but we don't really have the accommodations for 18 people uh, to stay at our house. So there's air mattresses, there's pulling up a piece of carpet, there's uh, pulling out the couch cushions. There's, there's a lots of things that we'll do to make accommodations, to make room, to make space for, for our family. And, uh, and I'm sure maybe you have experienced that type of thing. Uh, as well. Has anybody got like a crazy uncle or anything like that? My girls have a crazy uncle. His name's Joey. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, when they see him, they can hold their own when he comes around because Ruby just growls at him and it just keeps him at bay. Um, but regardless of who your family is, it is the season where we make room. It's a season where we gather no matter how Odd they seem, awkward they, or maybe you're the awkward one or the odd one, yeah? Uh, uh, no, matter, no matter the circumstances, no matter the level of connection or relationship, it is a season with which we make room. We make room. In our text this morning, we're reading about Joseph and Mary going to their hometown, going to where all of their family is. And we read, Luke talks about and records that there was no room, there was not enough room in the guest room. Now you can unpackage that. We don't really know the details, but if you look at the cultural context, you can learn some things. If you looked at the Greek words, you could learn some, probably learn some things. You could start to, 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 to gather some pieces and say, okay, maybe this is exactly what was meant. But what Luke was trying to convey was there wasn't enough space. He was trying to say there wasn't enough room for the two of them to have this baby where they were. There was no room. Interestingly enough, we are in a season where we need to be reminded that we need to make room. We have to open up our hearts and our lives to make room for him first and then the other people that we love. Do you know that relationship is the most valuable thing that you have? relationship is the most valuable thing that you have. Everything else that you're going to receive this Christmas is gonna, it's gonna pass away. It's gonna, it's, gonna, it's gonna die. You're gonna be excited for five seconds about that new gadget and it's going to be broken in two weeks, right? You're gonna be excited about whatever you're ripping that paper up about or, or whatnot and you're gonna be excited in that and it surely conveys, a, 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 I guess, a level of appreciation or it shows an acknowledgement, but it pales greatly in comparison to relationship. Relationship is huge. But so often 
as we're carving out room, we're carving out room for everything else except for relationship. Do you know that relationship can go beyond the Christmas season? Do you know that when you're with family and you're connecting around the table for breakfast or lunch or dinner or whatever, those relationships don't have to just be tied to one time a year? Relationships are super important. And so we're looking at this story. What is the point? Why did Jesus come? Jesus came to give us the gospel. The gospel literally means good news. The gospel is good news. And we all like good news. Who likes to get good news? I like good news. Yesterday, I was in my office here at the church and I was checking my email and I got an email from Bank of America. And I thought to myself, Bank of America? Why why are they emailing me? Click on the email and they said, Dear Kevin O'Day, we have recognized that you have a dormant account with us that has been dormant longer than 10 years. We are going to close this account and send this money that's in the account to the state for your retrieval if it's not closed or activity does not begin within the next 30 days. And I thought to myself, Bank of America? I don't bank with Bank of America. Oh, back when Sherry and I got married, I remember I opened a Bank of America account and I set it up to where our mortgage would be withdrawn from that bank so we didn't have to worry about it. So we had an automatic transfer from there to there. Man, I got money. It's probably a couple dollars, something like that. So I click and open up the account. There's over $2,000 sitting in that account. (laughs) That's good news. That's good news. $2,000 sitting right there that I didn't even, plus interest. It was great, $2,000. So I had some, some, good, some good news. And so everybody likes that type of news. Anytime there's a blessing or something added to you or something more, it's, it's good news. It's exciting news. And Jesus came to give us good news. Jesus came to bring good news. Now, the good news is good news, but it loses its meaning if we don't do anything with it. We can have the good news of the gospel and look at it all day long, hear about it all day long and not do anything with it and it loses its value or its meaning. Let me tell you something. If all I did with that $2,000 was come and tell you that I've got $2,000 sitting in the bank and I, and I tell my wife and I go and celebrate and shout to the world and I put it on social media, but I never go withdraw the funds, That $2,000 is meaningless to me. That good news is meaningless to me. In order to make value of it, I've got to go and get in my car, go to Bank of America and withdraw the funds. I did that 30 seconds after I got the email. Okay? When you receive good news, you've got to do something with that information. He has given us the best news. He has given us good news. What are you doing with this news. This is the season to make room. My challenge to us today as I go through this is, what are you making room for? Have you made room for what really matters? Have you made room for what really matters? So why did Jesus come? He came to bring us good news. Who did he come from? Jesus came for everyone. No one is exempt from this good news. Does anybody in here have a Sam's membership or a Costco membership? Okay, let me tell you something, especially at Costco. If you try to go into Costco without a membership, you ain't getting in. You try to go in and buy something, you got to have a membership. Some of you are members of gyms. Some of you are members of gyms since January, but you haven't been there since March. And you've still been paying the bill because you think you're going to go. But there is a price to membership. Is there not? There is a, there is a price for membership. I just moved our, our family's insurance to Farm Bureau. And he says at the end, there is a price for this membership. And when you pay for the membership, then you can access the benefits of the membership. I have something to tell you. You have benefits in the kingdom and your membership has been paid because of this baby Jesus. You didn't have to pay anything for the membership, but some of you are not accessing the benefits or doing anything with the benefits that you have because of this boy child, Jesus, who came as a child on this Christmas day. 
Why? Because you're not making room. You're not making room. You have access to the kingdom, but more than that, you have access to the king. Access is everything. Access is everything. I have a rule that I try to employ that anytime if, if my, my wife calls me or I know that my daughters are calling me or texting me, everything stops. They have access to me. You have access to the father because of Jesus. And this is for everyone. This is for everyone. He came to reconcile us to his father. We needed to be reconciled. Why? Because we were full of sin and sin separates us from God. But Jesus came and paid the price so that we can have access to the father. Are you making room for that access? Are you making room for the benefits of him, of his kingdom, of his relationship? Our sin caused the divide. Let me tell you something. The world divides, but the good news of the gospel unites. But more than that, beyond this, I should say, Jesus came to reconcile us to the Father. And so many of us stop right there. But what I really want us to grab hold of today is this. Jesus also came so that we can be reconciled to each other so that we can be reconciled to each other. I was talking just a moment ago about being together at Christmas. You're gonna have family coming in. And I jest about having an awkward uncle and I talk about making room, but there are situations in people's homes and different dynamics where you're not welcome or they're not welcome. There are situations out there where when it comes to the holidays or Christmas, instead of focusing on the sweetness and the peace that we've been guaranteed from Christ Jesus, we focus on the pain and the hurt and the bitterness and what they said and what they did and how they hurt me. And so this great divide and this great wall is built and let you see that person at the holiday and it's just so thick in the room, the wall and the divide and the need for reconciliation. Jesus came so that we would be reconciled to each other. There is a miracle that happened on Christmas morning in Jesus's birth, but there are miracles that can happen in your life if you will access and make room, if you will access and make room for the forgiveness, for the power of forgiveness and reconciliation in the lives of the people that you're connected to. I married Sherry O'Day 11 years ago. And let me tell you something. I didn't just marry Sherry. I married Robin. I married Rich. I married Richard. I married Tammy. I married Marie. I married the entire family. When you get married to Christ, you also marry the body of Christ. You are connected to every single person in this room. And so for you to reduce what he did to just have a relationship like this and not pay any attention to the relationship like, like this greatly reduces what he did, the potency and the power of what he did and why he came. There is power in reconciliation. And I'm telling you this today because in just a few short days, many of you are gonna be face to face with the people that this thing relates to. Some of you haven't picked up the phone to invite the person that has the wall to come over or to be a part of that because you've allowed the power of unforgiveness, the power of that pain, the power of that hurt to supersede relationship. And God wants to reconcile that this year right now. There is power in relationship. Guys, I'm telling you, there is nothing... Uh, there's not, many, there's not many things that are worse than being a, profession, a professing Christian who is jumping in the altar space, worshiping the Lord, wearing the t-shirt, but going out of this door and being unkind, being unforgiving, conveying shame on other people, not conferring dignity who walks, to the people who walk in the room. If we're to be the hands and feet of Christ, then we have got to walk in ways that are outside of the world. Peace, when we talk about peace, he came to give us peace. Well, in the world, peace is derived or obtained from war and battle. In the kingdom, peace is obtained from love and forgiveness. 
He has peace available for you if you'll tap into it. Are you making room for him to move in your life? We're gonna talk in just another week with each other and with our families about New Year's resolutions. And it dawned on me how quickly we gloss over Christmas. We open all the packages. We get done with that whole thing. We, we consider the Savior, uh, the birth of Christ Jesus. And then we get into the next week and we start talking about how I wanna lose weight. I wanna get stronger. I'm gonna do X, Y, I'm gonna make all these resolutions. I'm gonna do all of these things. But how often do our resolutions and the change tie to eternal things? The eternal things, yes, building relationship with him. But let me tell you something. If you start building a relationship to him, he's gonna start magnifying your need to build relationships with others. And when you start to walk closer to him, he's gonna magnify this. And guess what? He is sure enough gonna give you an opportunity to reconcile broken things. You do not have to hold on to broken and fractured relationships. You can address those and you can allow the reconciling, forgiving work of Jesus Christ, the power to come in and to completely reconcile relationships. He has the power to do that. He has the power to do that. You could be one conversation away from the change of a lifetime. You could be one choice, one conversation away from a lifetime of change in a relationship that could absolutely change everything about your life. One conversation. One of the things I noted whenever I was watching this this week is he says, I sent her a check. I sent her a check. I want you to know that your presence is more valuable than your presence. There it is. Your presence is far more valuable than your presence. And so many times we try to throw things that are not eternal as situations that we're not comfortable addressing. But I'm here to tell you that if you will make room for Jesus to do within you what he came to do, he will pave the way because he truly is the way maker for difficult conversations. And I believe that there are relationships that need to be restored. I believe that there are relationships that need to be reconciled. And before we just gloss over the next seven or 10 days and we just run past them and get into 2022 and we've made it through the holidays and we move on, I'm wanting to see some real change in 2022 in the area of intentionality in the way we treat each other and the way I treat people. And you may be sitting there thinking, I don't know that I have any real broken relationships. Well, you can ask the Holy Spirit to examine your heart. And if you are sitting there and you're saying, you know, I don't really think I have any broken relationships. Well, let me give you, let me go a step further then because it's not just about mending broken relationships, but it's also about creating new relationships. Because there are people that you're gonna encounter this week that you probably don't have very much depth in your relationship. And I believe God may have something very special if you'll just engage a little bit more. I've got an assignment for you. When you gather together this year, now this is gonna be harder than asking you to tithe, okay? Ready? When you gather together this year for Christmas, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, whatever you do, I want you to get a basket, a bucket, a tub, a shoebox, whatever. Get everybody's phone and put it in here. And set it aside. Talk to each other. What do we talk about? You've got 12 months that just passed. What has happened in those 12 months to you? Learn something new. What is your favorite color? What do you like to do? What has changed in this this year for you? If they're believers, what has the Lord taught you this year? What, What can I pray for you for? How's the work front going? Be interested in the people that are in front of you because I'm telling you, this is a mere distraction to stop you, to block you from building the most meaningful thing, which is relationships. Guys, relationships are gonna take us into eternity, not the stuff. Let's commit to remove the distractions and engage. 
And let's commit that if there are broken places, if there are broken pieces, if there are wounds, let's commit to stepping into those difficult places, trusting that we can draw on the strength of the Lord. Saying I'm sorry is not the same thing as saying, will you forgive me? Because will you forgive me is an invitation to a relationship. I'm sorry is a declaration or a statement to say, I'm sorry about the situation. Will you forgive me? Because I value our relationship far more than whatever it was that hurt me. God wants to do some reconciling work. Let me, let me tell you some instruction that he's given us when we gather together. Ephesians, Paul writes this. He's writing to believers. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Some of us miss up, mess it up right there. Right there. Because the minute we get together, it's about X, Y, and Z. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. And do not grieve. Do you know it grieves the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption? Get, all, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Paul would have not put that in there if we didn't have access to the strength we needed to get rid of those things. You have access to the strength you need to get rid of those things. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Why? Have you ever been forgiven? Absolutely you have. You've been forgiven by Christ Jesus. It's why he came. And if you've been forgiven by him, if he has made room for you, you ought to make room for everybody else. Because you're not just married to this king, you're married to his family. And there's some great, great, great people in his family, including you. I'm reminded, and I'm going to close here. We're going to worship. Reminded of being a teenager. I was an odd teenager. And, um, and you guys know, I mean, many of you know my story. You know that the Meek family was a big part of my, my story. And, and I remember going over their house for one of the first couple of times. And I would go in there and I just saw, you know, I just saw them so proactively really working at loving one another. I just saw it at at work and I was just amazed. And I remember going into their house and I would sit down and Margaret would come and she said, Kevin, would you like a glass of water? No, ma'am. Would you like something to eat? No, ma'am. Because I was in the middle of something that was so good. It seemed to be so too good to be true. And I was afraid that if I were to receive anything, if I were to participate, I would mess it up. You see, I believe there's spectators and I believe there's participants. The angels came to the shepherds and they said, come and see what the Lord has done. The invitation to come and see is to everybody, but it's up to the individual to make room. It's up to the individual to participate. And so I was sitting there in that family and I would see all of these things. And I'm like, if I, if I get a drink, if I do any of this, I'm going to mess up what has been given here. And so I would sit here and so many of us sit on the sidelines and we won't engage and we won't participate because we feel like we're going to mess it up. But there's nothing better than knowing that you've messed something up or that you have the potential to mess something up, but you're still invited to come in. You're still invited to come in because here's the deal. In the situation with the meat family and in the situation with the people you're connected to and in the situation with you and the Lord, love makes room for your mess. Love makes huge space for your mess. And so that's why you'll see people coming into this place and they'll come on Christmas and they'll come on Easter because they feel like they're too big of a mess to engage and participate. But let me tell you what changes that. You engaging them with difficult conversations You going to them and saying, hi, my name is Kevin. It's so good to see you. I don't look at you. I was at the gas station the other day and the person that was uh, helping me, he, he smelled really bad. He just smelled really, really, really bad. And I saw people going and they were, they were two registers and they were going and they were just making a big, just, oh, oh, I mean, it was just so obvious. And I went up 
And I just sit there and I could barely take the smell, but I wanted to confer him the dignity of being a person. Guys, I don't know what your story is. I don't know the stories of the people that you're gonna encounter this week, the people that come here on Christmas day or the 26th, but there are stories that are gonna come into this room that are apart and connected to a mess, but love covers mess. Our God covered your mess. May we cover the mess of those around us and may we embrace them in the heart, in the vein of reconciliation this Christmas. Would you stand with me this morning? I know it's a difficult time for some. Some of you may have lost people along the way. You got relationships that need to be restored. If you are an elder in this place, I'd like you to come forward. We're gonna open the altar space because I believe that there is power here this morning. There is opportunity here for reconciliation. And almost every one of you raised your hand earlier when I said, how many here need a way maker? This is an opportunity for you to connect with somebody and believe God for the strength that you need in this season to do difficult things. I encourage you to take advantage of the opportunity. Let's worship.